President Banks today. Uh, very happy to share with you that the city and the Spokane Police Guild have reached a tentative agreement on a new five-year contract that complies with the city charter. Uh, this contract meets the needs of the community. It shows support for police officers and also gains greater clarity on civilian oversight. Our Spokane Police Department uh, has been a leader in police accountability reform, and this is a result of that continued leadership and willingness to honestly evaluate uh, how officers can best serve our community. It's important for you to know how this contract came about uh, and how it came together, because we did things a little differently uh, than we have with previous negotiations. I got personally involved at the table this summer at the invitation of the police guild. The council president also personally joined me at that table for numerous hours long conversations. I cannot overstate how important that was to move, moving us forward uh, from the disappointment that we all felt when we had to return to the table this summer after getting so close. Uh, that disappointment was painful, but it also gave us the opportunity to hear from one another and to really listen to each other. Uh, those conversations weren't easy. They were difficult at times. They were honest. They were raw. They were hard. But we all learn more from each other. And the only way to have those kinds of conversations are in person and at the table. So I can't give enough credit to the Spokane Police Guild for being open to trying something new and being willing to sit down to have those discussions. It was exactly what was needed and to their credit, they knew it. So my personal thank you and sincere appreciation to the Guild and the Guild members who were part of the negotiations, also to Council President Beggs and to you, the City Council, for trusting me and trusting our relationship enough to be at the table every time we asked you to be there and it was a lot. The Ombudsman was also brought into the process and was given the opportunity to provide input. So the contract is for five years, retroactive to 2017. And Megan uh, from uh, HR will now join us. I'll turn things over to her so she can get into the specifics year by year. Megan. Great, thank you, Mayor. I am going to share my screen. All right, so I'm going to walk council members through um, the current uh, tentative agreement with the police guild. This is, as the mayor mentioned, a five-year contract, 2017 through 2021. Um, there is a scheduled wage increase for each of those contract years, effective January 1st of those years. Um, we've got 2.25% for 2017, 3% in 2018, 2019, and 2020 and 2.5% increase in 2021. This table I'm showing right now highlights um, some of the other economic um, uh, uh, portions of this contract. So we did make a, a minor modification to their deferred comp. Um, currently in the contract, they receive an additional $50 contribution to their deferred comp in lieu of a VIVA, um, which is a, a medical savings program. So that additional $50 contribution will stop upon ratification of the contract. Um, in lieu of that, we did agree to establish a health reimbursement account for guild members, and there will be a monthly city contribution of $75 per month into that account. Um, we also are memorializing specialty pay, which has been in effect since 2013 and 2016. Um, in 2013, there was a, an MOU established to provide a 3% specialty pay for special events supervisor and coordinator. And in 2016, there was an MOU um, to provide specialty pay for a major crimes detective, dignitary protection, um, and uh, field training officers that have a second uh, specialty pay. Um, it's 3% um, for uh, the additional FTO specialty pay and 2% for the major crimes and dignitary protection. We are eliminating the MEF team, which was previously a 4% specialty pay. Um, that team is no longer um, active within the department. So those are specialty pays that we have been paying since 2013 and 2016, uh, respectively. Also in 2019, um, Washington State enacted the paid family and medical leave law. Um, the city has agreed to pay the full cost of the employee's contribution to paid family medical leave, which is 0.4%. 
So the total annual cost of this contract is 3.5%. Um, a little bit of what goes into that is, is all of these wage items. So total cost of compensation is not just wages. It's also the benefits that are paid for and any specialty pay or additional cost items. So it comes out to an average 3.5%. All right, so the total cost of the contract is estimated to be $9.5 million, which will be paid for out of both the 2021 operating budget approved by the City Council in December and general fund unappropriated reserves. Uh, compensation for 2021 is within the 2021 budgeted amount. The City Council approved in December and will be paid out for the current, from the current operating budget. Retroactive pay for years 2017 through 2020 will come from reserves that have been set aside from previous year's budgets in anticipation of a contract agreement. Uh, one of the key uh, changes to this contract was independent oversight, also known as Article 27 within the, the Police Guild Agreement. So in the, the changes, the key changes made to independent oversight is that it extends the authority of the ombudsperson to the assistant or deputy ombudsperson, including the ability to participate in internal affairs interviews, to request further investigation, request mediation, or to make a determination that investigation is thorough and objective. Um, they can review and provide input on internal affairs case summaries and attend review board meetings for uses of force, collisions, and deadly force. This also expands the ombudsperson's access to body camera footage. It provides that the ombudsperson may appeal the classification of a complaint and type of investigation selected by the police chief. Uh, the new contract clarifies that all complaints may be independently investigated by the ombudsperson and establishes that the ombudsperson may request further investigation of major complaints and request that the police ombudsperson commission direct further investigation by the ombudsperson or a third party independent investigator. Uh, this tentative agreement also adds the authority for the ombudsperson to issue a closing report after the completion of a full department investigation, chief determination, and or a third party investigation that may opine on what happened. The third kind of key change to this contract is with respect to the park rangers. So as it currently stands, park rangers are only allowed to utilize their limited commission in Riverfront Park and Manitou Park. Uh, this tentative agreement um, allows the city to issue limited commission to and assign non-bargaining unit employees employed by the city's park rangers the authority to investigate and issue civil infractions and criminal citations to individuals believed to be in violation of crimes and infractions listed in the Spokane Municipal Code within any city park. So this does expand park ranger authority through all city parks in the city. All right, so the next few slides, I'm just gonna break down a highlight of the changes to the contracts per year. So effective 2017, there is that 2.25% COLA. Um, also changes to the recognition and the grievance procedure articles. Um, for recognition, we do recognize that directors are exempt from the police field bargaining agreement. Um, the grievance procedure is, is more just general updates to, to bring that language up to the current practices. Um, also, effective 2017, those specialty pay um, MOUs are codified as part of this agreement. 2018 is just the 3% COLA. In 2019, there's the 3% COLA, and then also that is when the Washington State Paid Family Medical Leave came to effect, and the city has been paying the employees portion since 2019 and will continue to do so through 2021. 2020, the only change is the 3% COLA, and in 2021, there's the 2.5% COLA, um, also the changes to the park rangers, and Article 7, Civilian Oversight, will go into effect, and then also the city will establish that health reimbursement account for these members um, with the $75 contribution. All right, so that covers the highlights of the contract, uh, and if there are any questions, I am happy to respond to those at this time. Any questions from council members? Well, seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor and the team. And, uh, we'll
people who come to us for help. So, moving on, uh, Michelle Hughes with the Rental Assistance Funding. Michelle? Hi, thank you. Um, this is just an SBO being brought forward to um, establish the budget for the money that we received from um, the grant money that we received for rental assistance. So it's giving us the ability to record the revenue and then the ability to extend the expenditures. Do we have a timeline yet on when those will be going out? Michelle, are we still in the uh, design phase of getting that out the door? I, um, Sally might have more information on that. I am not involved in the committee that is programming out the funds. Yeah, Thank I can you. just share that Cupid Alexander is the department director or the division director taking the lead on that, and um, we're actively working on getting those funds um, out into the community. Thank you, Sally. Great. All right, then. Uh, on to the resolution for the SIP loan for the parking unit replacement fund. Tanya? Hi, thank you, council members. Michelle and I are going to be tag teaming a little bit on this. You do have in your agenda packet the resolution as well as the SBO for the parking SIP loan. Um, it should be on about page 124 of your packet. I did want to share with you just a little bit about the projections because that is a critical part of what we looked at when we brought this forward to you. Um, in concept, but we want to share with you now that we've really taken a closer look at those revenues. Um, the team did a really great job, but I want to share that with you. So I let me share my screen here. Let's see, where did it go? Are you all able to see that okay? All right. So here's what the team did, and hopefully this looks a little familiar and you're starting to get accustomed to this layout, but here are the actuals for the downtown parking and then estimated for 2020. Um, and that estimate is largely based on actual activity that has happened, but we haven't officially closed 2020, so it's still considered um, an estimate that we're looking at. Um, but you can see here we're proposing three years of SIP borrowing. That's at 1.2 million in 21, 22, and 23. And then you can also see 2.6 million in 25. A lot of that in 25 is because of the LTGO bonds that will have a large payment. And that's what you see down here on this annual debt service where we have factored all of this in, but you can see a $5.7 million with a huge lump sum amount that needs to be paid out on those 2016 bonds. We did this so that we could make sure that on the bottom down here, the unappropriated retained earning balances in this special fund stays positive. Um, now, this does not necessarily assume any rate increases or anything of that nature. It's assuming status quo on the parking program. Um, so we feel fairly confident that this is something that the downtown parking program can handle and then fully replace all of those meters where they will, without the meter replacement, we're gonna lose our support on the software. So I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions. I know this wanted to be a discussion item. So we will stop sharing if that is okay with council. And this, this is also in your packet as well. So you can have a closer look at it. Council Member Wilkerson, I have a question. Uh, Tanya, has, has this been presented to the Parking Advisory Board? 
Oh, that is an excellent question, um, council member, and I do not know the answer to that, but we can find out for sure. Um, so they have a meeting tomorrow, and you might want to reach out to Andrew Rolls and see if you can get on the schedule. Thank you very much. Tanya, I'm going to ask uh, if I can, uh, Chair Wilkerson, um, Council President, you've been the closest, I think, to this board of late. And I know that we're kind of coming to the sunset, or we're hoping to come to the sunset of those bonds uh, with RPS. Does this extend that, or is this meeting the goals that you know of for the Parking Advisory Board? I'm not actually that close to the Parking Advisory Board. I, I didn't serve on it this last year. More June. than me, then. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know, but I do know um, that we have been paying a lot of debt service for the River Park Square parking uh, challenge. So we're looking forward to getting past that. And so I'm not exactly clear whether we're just kind of replacing that debt service with this debt service going beyond the five years. So I don't, maybe Tanya, you could tell us when in, in, in that one year where we make that lump sum, is that the end of the River Park Square bonds or are those continuing on? You're on mute. I apologize. <laughs> um, Michelle, did you have something to add? How it, how it was structured when we refinanced the bonds back in 2016, they did it over a 10 year loan. And it was 1.7 was the new debt service for the year. Michelle, you're breaking up on us. 2025, the lump sum payment. Of four million, like Michelle, you've broken up quite a bit. I don't, I don't know that the council covers caught what you were talking. Let me call in. As she's calling in, Tanya, was there anything else on that together, the resolution and the loan that you want to comment on before she calls in? Um, just to make sure that you were really aware that in that in that large debt service payment in 2025, that the park fund would have been completely able to make that lump sum payment without the $2.6 million SIP had it not been for COVID. When we looked at the loss of revenue, it was pretty substantial. It was well over $3 million of lost revenue that we're estimating. I think about 3.6, if my memory serves correctly, that was lost revenue because of COVID. Um, but because of COVID and that lost revenue, the $2.6 million SIP in 2025 is essential to make that 2016 bond payment and to carry the debt service requirements of the replacement of all the parking meters. So I want to make sure that that is just very, very clear to the city council of what we're proposing here. Um, and that it really is due to the COVID impact that we've had to, um, well, that we're recommending this type of series and structure going forward. So Michelle? Michelle? Yeah, can I just have, let's see if we can summarize this. We're going to pay off the bond but we're going to need a SIP loan to do it. So we're going, to, we're going to extend the debt service on this, but it'll be cheaper. Yes. How yes. long will it extend? I want to know when we will be done. That's <laughs> what I want to know. The $2.6 million. Can... Am I, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So when we paid off the bonds in 2016, it was a 10-year amortization schedule with a lump sum payment of like 4.6 in 2025. 
So they've been paying about 1.7, 1.8 million a year towards debt service, and the 2.6 million dollar SIP loan is the gap between the original debt service and the payoff of the 4.6. So the plan is to take out a five-year SIP loan to pay off that 2.6 million. It's about 533 thousand dollar debt service payment. So for the five years from 2025 to 2030, and then we would be completed and done. So this goes a, another nine years to 2030, because of the SIP. Okay, and and the rate is that under one percent? Is that what they're getting? Um, the rate on the current loan is 3.24. The SIP loan would be whatever the five-year Treasury rate is when we draw the money plus 50 basis points. Which so right really now it's running around one percent, one and a half at the current. most, right? So I, that's what I'm trying to draw a distinction here is it may extend the life alone, but the cost to the city is much less is what I'm seeing. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Can I follow up yeah. with that on, for Candace? Yes. Um, <clears throat> if we haven't, if we hadn't had COVID, if we had kept up with um, revenue for parking system, we wouldn't be in this position, that's my understanding. And secondly, I seem to remember Gavin Cooley say that we would be done with the bonds by uh, 2027. But that that is assuming all things being equal, in other words, we would have kept up with uh, parking revenue. Do I have that right? Um, I'm not sure about the 2027 maturity date. I know the 2016 bonds would mature with that lump sum payment in 2025, but you are correct in your understanding, had it not been for COVID, um, that that last series would not be necessary. Council President Vick. Yeah, two, two related things, well, three perhaps. I think uh, kind of pursuant to Councilmember Mum's question, I think the parking advisory and Almost everybody else in the city really wants the River Park Square bonds done so that we don't have to keep that sort of stain of shame uh, around and just be done. And then we could use parking revenues for what um, the opportunities are at. And I know the Parking Advisory Committee it feels very strongly about that. Um, secondly, uh, we have been working, uh, including the mayor, and working with Spokane Valley and the Spokane County Commissioners to uh, prepare a letter to our congressional delegation supporting uh, aid, federal aid to local and state governments because of COVID. And the markup on that right now, if, if it came as proposed, would be about $78 million to the city. And it's intended exactly to replace lost revenues. Um, so we might, if we, if we get that, and there's no guarantee or really even any likelihood at this point, we just have to keep advocating. But that could... Uh, keep us from going into further debt on that. And then the last thing is there's still a little bit of an outstanding issue on uh, where we're replacing meters and where we're re replacing or meters with meters and where we're replacing them with kiosks. A few months ago, the plan was to re replace meters with kiosks on all blocks with several meters. And then a last sort of semi-update there was a thought maybe we would go to meters only in the downtown retail core. And I think we're still waiting for a conversation about that, what those cost comparisons are and how that affects staffing. My sense, a lot of that had to do with trying to keep the traditional staffing uh, model. So we still need to address that. So we know what the cost for the equipment is going to be before we actually approve the SIP loan. Okay, so so if, if that is the case, should I'm not quite sure which direction the council would like to go with this. Well, I I was in touch with Chris Becker earlier that I was hoping she would come back to us and talk with us about the change in the meter kiosk plan so that we could get on the same page with that. Before okay, so with before they start buying them. What's our time frame? Yeah. 
Um, um, my understanding with uh, Chris Becker is they were getting ready to award these contracts pending the financial uh, approval. So when we have that finance in place, they were going to proceed with those those documents. Well, yeah. Those and, contracts would come to the city council for approval as well. Yeah, and I guess that's the point. That's why we needed that further conversation because we had we don't have an agreement on that. It's, I, di- I didn't realize that the contracts were going ahead without that agreement, but that's what we need to have that conversation so we know how many kiosks we're purchasing versus how many meters we're purchasing. Okay, I will I will work with uh, Chris Becker on that and get that to you scheduled just as soon as um, she is, is comfortable and ready. You've seen these documents, and this will just follow suit with that. Does that sound fair and reasonable? I do want to hear back from our advisory board as well. We will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mum. Council Member Mum, I am Karen Stratton and I are on that advisory board. And as I said, we have a meeting tomorrow. So it would really be advantageous for somebody from the city to talk about all of this. We will work to get that done. Thank you, Council Members. That was lively. Any more questions? Thank you, Tanya. And we will go on to Eric Finch and Dusty for the senior business analyst position. Good morning, Council Members. This is Eric Finch. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll start us off, and, and then, uh, Dusty, please, uh, you know, rescue me as necessary for, for any of the other details, and then we'll be uh, prepared to answer any questions the council has. Uh, this is really, I think, a good example of what we're seeing, really, I think, across a lot of different areas in our, in our city where uh, technology is increasingly becoming a, an integral part of, of, of operations on a, on a day-to-day basis. In this case, for uh, municipal court, uh, the prosecutor's office, the public defenders, and probation. Uh, this is a system endeavor that basically is is uh, linking uh, their systems together in one master system, uh, and really kind of you know being a catalyst for uh, I think it's over 25 different interfaces uh, that that happen between those those four departments. And so as this process has unfolded over the past couple of years. It became very clear, uh, you know, this this past year as they got to implementation, there was going to need to be additional resourcing, kind of at the both business and technical level, to kind of help uh, administer the system uh, going forward. And so it's not necessarily a kind of a, a, a software specialist per se, and it's not someone necessarily, you know, that's just from the courts or one of those departments. It's really a, this true a senior business analyst that really can look at the business process piece. Uh, and the technology piece and put them together. Uh, and so this is a gap we've seen in a few areas, and, and this is, I think, a perfect example of it where we need to invest and make sure there's the right support uh, in place to make sure this system can be operated uh, going forward. And in and, and part, it's because these systems have become very powerful in terms of the, their ability to be configured. Uh, and that configuration takes a little bit of process and technical skill to make sure that they can pull off working with the departments uh, in, in a much more direct way. Uh, so I, I I, like I said, I'll, I'll pass it to Dusty for anything I might have missed, but that's, I think, my best kind of five-minute summary. Dusty? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Eric. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that except for just to kind of springboard off what Eric said. This new system, once it's fully in production, eCourt is launching uh, two weeks from Wednesday. And then the other three systems will be in production uh, this year, early first quarter 2022. It creates an environment where we have brought all four agencies with competing interests and agendas uh, together into one one pool to play in, and it takes a, a higher level of skill set to navigate that um, because as processes get automated, agreements and standards have to be established. Um, uh, we're moving capacity, really. What this is, Eric mentioned, 25 um processes that will be automated. There's over 300 manual processes that go on between those four agencies and external agencies that we will, that will continue to be automated um, as things go forward. We need to make sure we're staffed correctly to, to keep this investment up 
to speed with the ever-changing requirements and, and legal statutes and everything that the court and all the agencies have to deal with, um, keep the system up to date. Um, it's going to be a big job. So, and with those automations come the capacity savings for the four agencies. We won't, you know, obviously are not sending anybody home. Um, but as time goes on and the offices get uh, more efficient with the solution, then they may not need that to refill that analyst position or that clerk position after they retire. Um, that's what Howard Delaney um, realized as a part of going from paper to just where. And we're, we're expecting the same organizational lift. We just can't predict it because nobody else has done this before. So um, we're kind of breaking trail. But we are definitely expecting to see capacity gains across the board for these agencies. That's about it. Any, any questions from council? Councilman Cathcart. Yeah, just wondering, is this, are these activities not something that could be contracted out to be done by a third party rather than another employee? Yeah, we've spent the last year, this is a very complicated business area, um, as well as a, a fairly robust software package, as Eric um, indicated. This, this really, this person is going to be playing kind of a solution architect role. Um, it's taken us a year. Um, you know, we have a really good person in place right now on a contract with us um, who's filling this role. And frankly, he's probably the only reason we're ready to go live with eCourt in two weeks. Um, he's snapped into this position. He understands the technology. And I don't know how he did it, but he figured out the business side of it as well in less than a year. Um, I'm still struggling with it. And I've been neck deep in it for two years or more. So it, it is something, it's a, it is an investment. Um, where we've seen other vendors, and we've, we've realized this in the past where we've brought folks in, we've, we've had them on a contract for a year or more to help us get work done. They walk out the door with a lot of institutional knowledge. They, we, have, we basically have to start over. Um, and I'd be hard-pressed to, um, I think we'll be hard-pressed to find someone who can get in and get ramped up as quickly, especially on a contract. I mean, that's a big investment. You're paying them to learn. Um, and it's a big learning curve, steep. So just a quick follow-up. So if we have somebody on contract, sorry, go ahead. No, I just, I just wanted to add to that, 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 you know, we, we take, you know, I think a pretty deliberate look as, as, as we look at technologies that are coming in and often we'll start with project positions that help us get it, kind of identify where the workload is going to be in terms of like a total cost, cost of ownership. And sometimes if we see it's just going to be a peak while the system is being implemented, right, it can be just that kind of project or contract work, and then it can basically go back to, to the normal kind of staff level. In some cases, what we're seeing, though, is the, the, the level of work and I think the attention of detail that where, where that person needs to be really fully invested with those departments is so high uh, that it makes more sense for it to be a full-time employee versus, versus contracted out. Well, hearing that need, I guess, just to follow up, I'm wondering what's the delta then between the, the contract and what we're paying out now versus what it will cost to have a, a full-time employee doing the work? Uh, I, it, probably about 60%, but uh, Dusty, go ahead. No, I thought I had a slide on that, but I don't know if I do at hand. And you can get me that, that into offline too. But. House member Mom. Thank you. My recollection is those were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it was just giving me heartburn when I saw some of those contracts. Um, and they are very expensive. That, that's what I remember. And to that point, I also know that this is a very competitive field. Um, my son-in-law happens to be in this. And I, my concern is that are we offering enough? Because we were in a position, if I recall, a couple years ago, where we couldn't hire anybody because the market was too hot for this position. So do you feel you have enough funds to hire in this space? That'll have to be a Tanya question. <laughs> <laughs> well, council member, that's, it's, it's a good question. And it's always going to be a challenge with, with areas like technology or a specialty area like this. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why Dusty's recommendation, I think, is very sound in terms of making this, you know, kind of a senior level class. And so that gives us, I think, some 
uh, some capability to at least, you know, have I think the pay at a at a at a, at a, at a very good uh, you know starting rate here uh, for Spokane. Uh, we, we may obviously have to look at uh, the step level, you know, in terms of who applies and what type of experience they bring to the table when we get to that point. Well, something to keep in mind. I would not be surprised if you've got to go up. But good luck. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would not be surprised either. Any other questions? Thank you. Is Eric and Dusty. Uh, it is technical. I will admit as a council member and maybe others are really deferring to your experience in this arena to get the work done. So thank you for your work on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the support. Absolutely. We're going to committee briefings. Um, redistricting process. Mike Piccolo. Yes. Good morning. Can you all hear me all right? Good. Once every 10 years, we get to go through the decennial redistricting process, which is part of the federal census process. So just a quick history here. Council districts were first formed in 1999. A couple years after that, we did our first redistricting, and then we did it again in 2011. So this is the 10th year for that process. So the federal census occurred in 2020, and the typical procedure is once the census is done, that data the following year, 2011, will be provided to the states, usually in the first quarter, pretty early on. Uh, so it, it would go to the Washington State Redistricting Commission, and that commission was just reappointed in January by the legislative leadership. Unfortunately, we're in a little bit of a unique situation with COVID, where the delivery of the federal census is significantly delayed. Uh, due to COVID, and I think there are some other reasons going on. Regardless, some of the reports I've read indicate that the federal census material will be delivered later this fall, around the end of September. So uh, a very large uh, delay there. Again, the typical process is it goes to the state commission and the state at that point has 45 days to deliver this information to all the cities, counties, special purpose districts, any district body that has districts based on population. Uh, so again, we're waiting for this information. Normally it would be coming to us pretty soon, uh, but we are looking at a noticeable delay. Under state law, once we receive this information, we have the city has eight months to adjust its council district boundaries and adopt a plan, which is then provided to the state auditor, which will then adjust those boundaries uh, for the following elections. I think it's helpful to kind of go through, just say you have in mind what type of criteria the state is looking at for when you adjust your boundaries. Under state law, uh, the, the plan the council will adopt follows certain criteria, and here are the, the ones set up by state law. Each district shall be nearly equal in population as possible. Each district shall be as compact as, po as possible. Each district shall consist of geographically contiguous areas. The population data may not be used for purposes of favoring or disfavoring any racial group or political party. And to the extent feasible, the district shall coincide with existing recognized natural boundaries and shall, to the extent possible, preserve existing communities of related and mutual interest. So now we shift over to the city's, uh, the, the local process. Once we receive this information, we shift over to section 59 and 60 of the city charter. And those two sections overlap a little bit. Part of 59 was created for the initial distancing process where the initial group back in 1998 had to come back to the city council with three distinctive plans for the council to adopt. We're not doing that process. We're doing the redistricting process under section uh, 60, but again, there is some overlap. So in terms of membership, the, the local board consists of three members nominated by the mayor, appointed by the city council, the council president, and one other council member serve as advisory members. In the past, the three members have been appointed by the three council districts. That's not man mandated, but that has been the process that has been followed. So the council is to confirm the redistricting board and to establish a schedule for developing 
filling and implementing that district plan. Uh, from my experience, I did work on this in 2010 and 2011. Our office will provide the legal assistance. We had great assistance from the planning department in providing various GIS type maps that would show the existing boundaries, they would show the, uh, the new population distribution. We had very good maps showing the, the current districts divided by precincts, divided by council districts. That's a couple of things to keep in mind when we go through this process. We take great effort not to split any voting precincts or to carve off council districts unless necessary. And we do have some council districts, I'm sorry, neighborhood, neighborhood councils that do fall into two council districts. That does happen. But the county auditor uh, will greatly appreciate if we do not split precincts. In fact, I think they'll go so far as to uh, raise certain objections if, we, if that did happen. And, and to, that that hasn't, has not happened in the past, but I do want to just point that out. So at this point, I would anticipate and would recommend that the city go ahead and start the process to recruit and appoint those three members of the, of the board to get them established, uh, have them meet, go through the criteria, go through the background, start preparing that information, even though we know we may not get the federal census material until uh, in, into the fall. So unfortunately, we have plenty of time to do this, but we never want to delay that process. We want to get started as soon as possible. Are there any questions? I see if I missed anything here. Uh, the, the the criteria for the membership might be worth pointing out. That was going to be my question. My <laughs> so that is in the city charter. The members must be registered voters of the city, must be current residents of the city and having maintained their primary residence within the city for the past two consecutive years. No member of the district shall be a registered lobbyist in the state of Washington within one year prior to selection. They cannot campaign for elective office or actively participate or contribute to any political campaign of any candidate, candidate for local, state, or federal office uh, with, while, while a member of the board. So that, that applies while they are a member of the board. They cannot hold or campaign for a city position for two years after the effective date of the district plan. Uh, so the member, members of the board would have to know these criteria going in. Uh, some of the criteria are requirements before they become a member of the board, and some of them carry over after they leave the board. And again, looking back, it's my recollection that the board did have a series of meetings, and hopefully they can have their meetings in, in person and not be doing remote meetings, especially since we may not be seeing this material till into the fall, but they had one meeting in each council district. Then they'd have one meeting to take public comment on their recommendation. They would adopt their recommendation plan, forward it to the city council, and then there are some meeting requirements for the city council before it adopts any plan adjusting those boundaries. And at this point, I, 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 have, I have no knowledge of what the census data will show. I've heard some people talk about information they have uh, from the Office of the Financial Management and other just planning efforts over the past 10 years, how the population has shifted between the three districts. Hopefully we'll see the numbers come back with the numbers pretty close to each other, but if not, we will look for the board to make recommendations, how to adjust the boundaries to bring those numbers as closely as possible. On the last plan adopted in 2011, it was 33 point percent for every district, so they were they were very close to each other. Each district was 33 point uh, a fraction of that. So they were very, very close to each other. So Mike, for clarity, once this committee has reestablished the boundaries, then they become effective 2022? Well, the, 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 disc, the board will make a recommendation to the council, and the council adopts the plan that changes the boundaries. Okay. And those will become effective for the next, next election cycle. And that's a very good question there. So this fall's election process will not be affected by the federal census. 
even in a good year, we would not be trying to change boundaries in the middle of the city election process. Uh, with the data coming so late in the year, it's even easier to say, no, this will go into effect for 2022's election. So this May, we have the filing deadline. And then we have the primary and general election in, you know, later in the year. And those are all based on the current boundaries. So we will not be changing the boundaries at all to impact this fall's election process. But it's, it's really the 2023 elections that it impacts. And there's not a Correct. municipal that's election next. in 2022. So. Correct. So that's 2023 is the next uh, general municipal election after the current election cycle. Any other questions for Michael? Thank you. Well, all right, we have one. Thank you. To do. Yes, Great. definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, on to Sally Stouffer so for the 2020 COVID expenditure. Sally? Good morning, Council. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I just have some summary information for all of you um, on the expenditures related to COVID response in 2020. Um, as you can see from my spreadsheet here, I have it broken out into four main categories. And then the columns represent um, what funding source um, was able to fund these expenditures. So our first category here is public health expenses. Um, these costs represented things like PPE, uh, disinfecting and sanitation of public buildings um, and things like plexiglass uh, barriers for public, uh, for public areas. Uh, the total of those costs is uh, $547,000. The next category um, we have here is the payroll expenses for public employees dedicated to COVID-19. Um, and as you'll see here, we have the majority of our funded costs relate to our first responders in our fire department. Uh, we also have some funding that allowed for some law enforcement. Um, but if you look into the third column here with the total cumulative city paid expenditures, at the beginning of the um, of COVID response, uh, we had all staff that were um, working on COVID response items code their time um, so that we could track the efforts that were being put forward on, on response to COVID-19. Um, initially, we were hoping that those costs, even for um, previously, you know, already budgeted staff might be covered. But even when we determined that there wasn't going to be funding to, to support that, it is still good data collection, um, and it really helps us to quantify the efforts related to the um, city response. And uh, so the total for that is over $2.6 million. The third category um, is expenses to facilitate compliance with COVID-19 measures. This included all of the costs that um, we incurred uh, getting our telework operations up and running. Um, it included uh, items and paid for paid sick and family leave for staff. Um, and it also included the costs that were incurred to um, for the care mitigation of our homeless population in compliance with the um, public health district. Uh, you can see that those costs uh, total more than $2.4 million. So our final category, um, and where we spent the most of our um, available funding, is in the economic support area. These were uh, programs that were done to um, help mitigate the negative um, economic impact of COVID-19, and also programs to help stimulate uh, business recovery. Um, so you can see um, of that, we've got $6.7 million um, in expenditures there. Uh, so for, for a total for this, for this response uh, is $12,463,000. Um, we did have additional funding sources that are not uh, shown here that were passed through to some of our, our other partners. Um, but these are the costs that were really related to city, uh, to city operations. Um, the total amount of, of CARES funding of the $9.99 million, that, those revenues have already been received. The second column of the $751,000, that is a claim that's been put into FEMA, but it has not yet been approved, and we have not yet seen the funding for that. And, um, I would I hope that we see that by the end of 21, but um, FEMA is a tough funding source, and um, I can't guarantee you'll see the catch. 
um, before the end of the year. Do I have any questions related to this information? I just say thank you, Sally, for showing the investment we made in our community. I, I think it's put the numbers how that equated to people. If there are no questions to Sally on this, do you want to continue on, Sally? Yep. Yeah, let me go ahead and share a different screen. I'm having a hard time finding the So I'm going to, um, I've asked Hanalee to help give me some support on this. And since I'm not finding it, Hanalee, please, please, please go ahead and um, share my PowerPoint that I have. Um, this is just related to our minor contract threshold. That contract threshold is um, is where contracts are required to go to council for um, approval. Um, I've got information on the FMC section 0706 under minor contract defined. And in this, um, there is, this, we're at the second slide now. There is um, the information that I've got highlighted in red there is the information on how that minor contract threshold is increased each year. Um, and it's done by um, simply just a calculation based on the consumer price index. Um, it allows uh, administration to increase the minor contract threshold each year by that average of CPI. Um, back in 2018, we did some minor changes to this section of code, um, which uh, changed the, um, the rounding from the nearest hundred dollars to the nearest thousand um, dollars, which allowed us to um, not have um, really you know, small small amounts um, of that minor contract threshold. So, Hanley, we just switch to the to the final slide. So, back in 2018, we were able to get to these really round numbers of 50,000 for the minor contract threshold um, singular and 130,000 for multiple year. Um, those nice round numbers are um, easy to communicate to staff, they're easy for staff to remember. Um, and so instead of increasing the minor contract threshold each year, um, we have stuck with those nice round numbers, but we have still done the calculation of what that increase is allowed to be um, through each year. But instead of changing that threshold, we've just rolled it forward. Um, so I'm anticipating in the next year or two, based on CPI, we'll probably get to some, um, some new round numbers of probably 55,000 and 140,000 or something along that line. Um, we've just made the administration, uh, administrative uh, decision to instead of changing it each year, which then has to be communicated to staff, all of our um, information on minor contract thresholds has to be um, reprepared and resent out. We have just uh, stuck with those nice round numbers, um, and then uh, when we get to uh, a, a point where it makes sense to move that forward, we will do so. But I just wanted to share that this is a calculation. Um, it is just a simple math calculation, and that when we do move that forward into different numbers for that minor contract threshold, um, it is just based on the allowable calculation. Do we have any questions on that? Questions for Sally? Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And now the windstorm. We all remember it. Wasn't that long ago? We're going to have an update from uh, Michelle and Sarah Nuss. And with my technical difficulties this morning, Tanya, can you share the presentation? Uh, give me just one moment to pull it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
while she's doing that, I'll just kind of summarize a little bit. Um, this, this slide is just showing the 2021, what we have estimated that the costs are going to be for the city for the windstorm this year, windstorm event. Um, when we initially pulled all the information together, we, um, Sarah Nuss had reached out to all the department heads and they gathered all the information and it was reported to um, the state to see if there was any FEMA funding available. And on the first round, we did not um, qualify. Um, but since then, we have qualified and it has been pushed up to that level. So that's good news that we might have some relief from what it has cost the city. Um, basically, in January 11th of 2021, a 71-mile gust recorded at the Spokane International Airport, making the windstorm as strong as the one that was in 2015, leading uh, General uh, Governor Inslee to declare a state of emergency. Uh, the city of Spokane complied, compiled projected costs of the storm and submitted them to the Department of Emergency Management for the consideration of FEMA reimbursement. And like I said, we did not... Um, we're not eligible at that time, but since then we have gone up to over $3 million in costs cumulative across the city. And so we have been pushed up to that level. Um, next slide. So as of the report, we have compiled um, categories and what the, the city um, has incurred. Um, so for with fire personnel and response, uh, general property damage of 14,000 vehicle loss and fire department where a tree fell on a vehicle, um, basic tree removal within the city um, through the streets department and the water department, um, parking at, uh, park asset damage of 732,000, which includes the historic butterfly. And then um, Peaceful Valley, it's not directly related to the windstorm per se, 100%, but the the side of the mountain was um, damaged due to strong rains and wind did lose some trees and then they had to take down some trees and it has further weakened the hillside sliding down into the road. Um, and then we put in a $250,000 contingency as well. So a total of 2.3 million on that for the general fund, um, proposed, to, proposed to come from the contingency fund. And then um, other damages, power lines from the water department, wastewater lift station, and then other tree removal. And this here is just going to come from the basic department's operating budgets. Is that the last slide? Oh, and then there was property damage to the um, public defender's building as well that's included in here. Um, they did put... The Pleasant Valley has a contract for the geo um, technological for the survey of the damage, and then they've estimated that that um, landslide could cost up to a $1.1 million repair. Madam for Chair. Total, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead in total, and then I'll ask my question. I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw it. We've got it in the package. Yeah. Okay. So um, I do have some questions about the, I think it's Peaceful Valley. Is that is that what we're talking about? Um, yeah. The landslide. Isn't a large portion of that private property? I do not have an answer for that. I would have to contact Kyle Tuig. But and I'm sure that's about. I don't know if we've had that come to us yet for allocating it. And I, I think we may need to have a discussion about what's happening there and what the remedies are because of the nature of the slope. It could be in a critical area, geohazardous area, and what our responsibility might be and a private landowner's responsibility might be. Um, so I, I just thought I'd bring that up. Council member, Mom, you are exactly correct. There's a lot more information that's going to be forthcoming on that. Um, this is certainly we wanted to start bringing to your awareness the potential financial impact um, as it relates to the entire windstorm. And there will be uh, special budget ordinance items coming to you related to the impact of the windstorm. That you're exactly spot on. There's going to be a lot more information. They're starting to do some of the engineering review um, even now. And so you will get a lot more of those details um, coming. And I'll just pass on. I had a former uh, resident tell me that there had been some illegal grading in that area, they thought, 
So I just thought I'd throw that out there. It might be interesting to see what happened um, besides the loss of the trees. And the other addition is our parks department was really walloped. And how do they factor in here? Um, they are part of that uh, parks detail that, that we just briefly showed you there. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Garrett would love to bring you more information about the details of that. Um, again, we wanted to present to you and prepare you financially for that big picture of what that's going to be. Parks is easily facing between six to eight hundred thousand. We're estimating around the seven hundred and thirty thousand um, mark. A, a large portion of that being the historic butterfly. Um, how we go forward to to repair that. Well, parks and golf, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think their numbers are higher than that. That's my suspicion. Um, and I also just uh, want to mention that it might be worth, maybe there's no chance of going for a second request um, on FEMA because a lot has changed with FEMA and even Malden got some FEMA. So I don't know what these new numbers and we did. We did just get word last uh, on Friday, I think it was, right, Michelle, that we we now have hit that threshold, and some of these costs are going to be reimbursable through FEMA. We're going to still need your authority to spend money <laughs> um, to get all these repairs in order. But yes, to your point as well, the the golf courses have seen some damage, um, and so these are just the best estimates that we have at this time, and we'll continue to keep you updated. On, on the turn of events there. Thank you. Councilor McCat Card. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I think Garrett's on the line here too, but I think they were gonna provide a presentation at Urban Experience to talk about some of those specific costs to, to parks. Yeah, that's correct, um, council member. And you know, some of this is worst case scenario too. We're coming up with some creative ideas around the restoration and replanting efforts, as an example, um, you know, looking for some seed money to get it started, but then working with partners like at the Lands Council and fundraising uh, with uh, some other opportunities to keep that uh, moving in the positive direction. Uh, you'll see from us, even though it's a 700,000 is some of our estimates, um, we just want to keep moving in a positive direction. So we'll probably come at you with smaller increments along the way just to keep the work happening and make these parks safe again. And there are some unknowns out there too. Irrigation is a big one. Um, we haven't turned on our irrigation yet. And you look at Comstock Park and about every square inch of that park was impacted. And so uh, there could be some other infrastructure needs in there as well. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, Parks has been amazing. So we appreciate that work. And we're sure there are unknowns out there. So we'll be waiting to hear more from you. Any other questions? around the windstorm. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that was a challenging time. It was great how our city once again pulled together uh, to help keep us all safe. Uh, moving on to the COVID update, Amber. Good morning, council members. Um, hope everyone had a good weekend. I've got just a very brief COVID update for you today. Um, We've been seeing a lot of encouraging trends again. So uh, I sent the report out last week of the COVID positive cases internally, and we had just one uh, confirmed positive case last week, which is the sixth uh, week in a row of single digits, which is, I think, really exciting um, on a lot of fronts. I know that there was a period of time last summer where we had four weeks in a row where we had a count of zero. So I don't want to get too far ahead of things, but we're at least trending in a really positive direction. I think um, at least on the HR side and I'm sure all around, everyone's looking forward to that, that first week of zero. So um, maybe it will be this week. But um, so that actually for the city population totals 198 total cases, uh, which is about 9% of our total staff population. Um, outside of that, I don't really have a whole lot of updates for you. We are really, uh, starting to turn our focus more towards the future and really evaluating less uh, what is happening happening operationally and much more planning for what does the future of work look like uh, when we, you know, get to um, future phases, kind of and trying to think through and anticipate what those might look like and how we can set ourselves up for success um, when we get to that stage. It's 
really a lot of conversation at this point as to what the needs of the organization will be, what the concerns and needs of staff are, and how we kind of bring those together and, and plan for uh, recovery and eventual reopening of the city. So um, that's really all that I have for you this morning, unless there's any questions, which I'm certainly happy, happy to answer. Councilmember Kinnear. Thank you. Thanks, Amber. That was good. I want to know if we have plans to do more external outreach and update to the population. Right now, I'm getting my news from TV News, and I'd like to see us be more um, proactive about engaging our constituents, making sure that people have accurate information, because we're getting a lot of conflicting messages right now. And I think it's important that the city have a face on this and take a lead. We're not seeing leadership from, at least I'm not, from the health district. It's, it's crickets over there. So I think that in absence of anybody else taking the lead, that the mayor and council have to step out and talk to the community about each step that we're going to take to open back up, be really proactive about the numbers, not just internal numbers, external numbers, and, and what's the plan to open up? How are we going to roll out, get businesses up and running, um, have people feel safe going to dinner, out to a bar, or to a movie? So that is my ask. Thank you for sharing that, and I will make sure that that gets relayed. Um, I, I, I think there's another question. I will make sure that that gets relayed. And I'll wait. I was just going to say, I think that there's sort of two two areas of focus. One would be really internal, um, how we prepare the city, city staff, the city, um, you know, counter space, things like that for reopening. And then there is that public facing piece. Um, so I can make sure that we get the appropriate people in the loop on that and that, that your uh, request is relayed and that it is um, taken into consideration. We try to focus on those things. I'll just underscore that um, we've had really good attendance at our neighborhood meetings. So, um, you know, that is a little silver lining with some of the remote um, areas. And we, we can do some outreach, uh, and the city can, at, at those meetings uh, and assist or help identify where there's some, some gaps. I, I guess my question, let's just start with the internal. Are we asking our staff to report to you when they're inoculated? and what their timeline might be. So you're tracking where we're at on um, immunity. No, we are not asking our staff. Um, I, I can certainly look into that. I think we would have to have that be a voluntary um, option, but we can certainly look into, uh, you know, tracking that information on a voluntary basis and seeing, but no, as of right now, we are not, um, so I can, I can find out about that and report back. And then are we assisting? Do we have a hotline or an assistance for our staff? How do they know when they're due or ready, or can we assist them in making those appointments? And that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think we have anything set up. I think that we have referred people to the base finder, like um, it's sort of the standard across the state for just – any citizen or resident of the community can go through the phase finder. I think with first responders, there was a bit of a different approach with the, um, the vaccination clinics. There was a different level of priority there. But as far as um, our, our, you know, the normal staff, uh, we do not have a hotline or anything like that in place. We are referring people to just the, the um, resources that are out in the community. Um, I certainly can look into that as well. I'm not sure that there would be anything, I'm not sure that there'd be anything special we could stand up, but we can certainly evaluate and look and look into it. Well, let me recommend that we can because we did it for flu shot. And we have hundreds of employees who can give inoculations and that's our firefighter staff. And so if there's a way, because we are one of the largest employers and we could take some leadership here, I think it would be very um, fortuitous for us to take a lead 
and get City Hall open sooner and get everybody who's eligible, and maybe they already have, inoculated, but to plan for it, um, I, I think it would be a great thing for us to do. Thank you. Councilor McCackhart. Yeah, on that note, uh, so I, I guess I, maybe I just see some different different information out there. I see a lot from our health district. Uh, and, and I, Frank uh, Velasquez, Dr. Velasquez, last week gave a presentation uh, to one group, and in it he commented that they could scale up to 10 times what they're doing right now, and they can do it in very short notice. We just need the governor to provide the, the allocation of the vaccine to get it done. And so I'm preparing a letter to send to the governor to ask him to, to do that as that vaccine becomes more available. Um, you know, we should definitely make that an emphasis. And Anybody who wants it should have access to it, and so that's definitely a priority. But um, if others are interested in also signing that letter, I can provide that to others to take a look at as well. Any other comments or questions for Amber? I, I will say, Amber, that the health district has done a fabulous job with mobile clinics, uh, even with our firefighters in that supporting role so when we get to the various phases, I know as Councilmember Kinnear said, people are starting to ask about there will be the next phase. There will be there will be another phase. There will be phase three, and then what are we looking at, or what are the conversations around what that might look like for us as a city and the services we provide, and then how we support our businesses going forward. So um, thank thank you much for that. Okay, so I saw Paul and Gozi on the elevator this morning, and I want to make sure that his eyes were wide open since the new addition to his family. And he goes, yeah, I have the late shift. So, Paul, I'm going to let you just take us home from finance today, and I'm glad to see that your eyes are still wide open. Thank you, uh, council member, and good, good morning, uh, city council. I'm going to stop my video and share my screen real quick. We have uh, two of our monthly reports uh, to provide, and then uh, we're going to hand it back over to Tanya. I think we have the budget survey results uh, also on the agenda just for a quick one-minute wrap-up at the end. So I'm going to stop my video, share my screen. Okay, so we'll start with the uh, general fund monthly report. And again, this is part of the packet and was sent out, I believe, earlier this week. Just two uh, two changes uh, for the month of January for 2021. The first was a public defender uh, received a grant from the Washington State Office of Public Defense uh, for $50,000. That was an SBO that was in front of council uh, beginning of January. And then the second item was the encumbrance carryover SBO, which uh, since it began in January, actually posted for January, even though you saw it in February, now it's about $4.1 million for the general fund. Uh, so if there's no questions on this one, I will uh, move over to the next. And this is our, our BT2 report, our budget transfer two report. So this is citywide, anything that is crossing uh, categories from what is originally appropriated for in the budget to, to a different type code different type category. Uh, this is the report that is going to be impacted most from the, the changes that uh, council adopted through the ordinance back in January, which would require uh, SBOs for transfers from personnel lines to non-personnel lines. And that is uh, effective March 12th, 2021. We've sent out uh, guidance to the uh, division accountants uh, this morning to give them a heads up that that's coming up. So this uh, report will be probably skinny down in the future, but you may see more SBOs coming forward. Uh, the majority of these ones from January are position reclassifications, which typically happens uh, following the adoption of the budget when we have a lot of movement for progressive promotions or, or departments making some changes. So you can see all of those uh, on the January report and happy to take any questions on this one. Questions for Paul? In that case, anything else before we hand it over to Tanya? Uh, nothing for me. Thank you. 
I just had a question. Are we going to get the monthly sales tax reports? We usually get those once a month, and so I don't feel like we've gotten them much lately. So I don't know if, if anyone's lined up to do that. So. We'll, we'll make sure that all the council members do uh, start receiving that report on a monthly basis. Um, many of our reports, as you know, are going to start to change just a little bit. Um, the first month of January, there's it's it's there's not a lot of year two actual actual uh, information to to convey, but we will start ramping up those monthly reports and include them in your package. Thank you, Todd, and go ahead with the survey. So on the survey, um, the survey results, and you do have the full report in your packet. So we had a lot more responses from managers and executives, and it was really focused a lot on general fund departments. Um, but thankfully, we had a full breadth of respondents, um, nearly 40 respondents, and from all different funds, too, but most of them were those managers and executives in the general fund. Um, the average of our rated questions, we had a series of questions, I believe seven of them, on a scale of zero to four, zero being not satisfied at all, and four being very, very satisfied. Our highest rating was the 2.86 regarding the information and if folks were getting answers to their questions that they were asking. So staff did a really great job. Um, in that area. The lowest was in two was a 2.34 regarding public involvement. So always room for improvement. I have not seen one of these results come back where there was not room for improvement. We did have three questions that were open-ended for comments. Um, what was the best part of the 2021 budget process? By by far the most common thread of, um, of conversation that went on was about the collaboration and the focus was much more on the priorities. Um, a couple comments about being less stressful um, and there are some quotes for you. Shift to priority-based budget philosophy, early and frequent collaborate, collaboration between the council and the administration, and Paul has made the budget process much better. And I can say amen to that. <laughs> um, what would you like to see changed for 2020? Unequivocally communication. Most every comment was in some way, some form about communication um, and visibility into the decision-making process. Again, that is still just communication and how it gets done. Um, need better visibility with council and administration, more transparency from leadership. And lastly, what should be the highest priority for 2022? That process, planning, and again, communication, <laughs> and certainly funding the essential services first. Um, aligning the budget decisions with strategic objectives. And I know that there's been a lot of focus on that over the last several months. Um, a full planning process, fiscal responsibility. And I think this was really important, providing critical services at a reasonable price. Um, that is where your analytics will really come into play is to say, what is that reasonable price that should be paid? and basing our budget decisions on actual revenues instead of the previous year's budget. That was a shift that we had to take, certainly in 2021, um, when we knew our revenues were gonna be down. We couldn't use previous or historical averages as a basis in a go forward motion. Um, revenues were severely impacted and they will continue to be um, in one degree or another. So you have the full report, council members, and we're gonna be using this to form the next process, which is really, we've already had several discussions, but the discussions are gonna start in earnest over the next probably six to eight weeks 
in what the 2022 process is going to look like and what priorities we're going to focus on. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and see if you have any closing comments. Councilmember Mum, and then Councilmember Katkar. Thank you. I loved this uh, response, Tanya. This was great. I read all the comments. I thought they were really, um, you know, a, a variety of, of inputs, which I'm sure you gained a lot from that. Um, you were faced with an incredible, you and your team, an incredible year. <laughs> and having to put this all together with, you know, a lot of fresh faces involved as well. So um, kudos to you for um, getting it done. And we got it all done on time. And I know, obviously, more communication, more transparency. We all wanted that in, in the year of COVID. And I think we'll, we'll get there. I wanted to call out one comment on number two that I think is just going to take us to the next level. And I don't know who put it in, but they're spot on. It says we need a full planning process retreat, executive reviews, integration with the strategic plan, the comp plan, the CIP, and department initiatives to prioritize the resources. This is something that's been missing, I think, from the city, is we've got to basically put our money where our mouth is, where all our initiatives, all our code, everything, we've got to align it. And I know um, that's the whole priority-based budgeting. Super excited to get there. But when we marry the money with the goals um, that council outlines and work with mayor staff, we're going to get so much more done for the city. And I'm super excited to see that happen in the future. Thank you. Hey, Tanya. Uh I'm wondering, so given the, the results of the, the survey on the public participation side being a little bit lower, how early do you think this year the public facing portion of the budgeting process will begin to give, give the public more, more opportunity to be part of that? Um, that is a great, great question. Um, I'm going to be talking with the mayor about um, the proposed plan. We've been talking here with staff. We were anxious to get the survey we laid out a straw man for the process for 2020. Um, now we have the survey results. We just got them last Wednesday night at the close of business. So we're sharing them with all of you just as soon as we can. And within the next month, I'll be having conversations with the mayor about the plan. We are wanting to certainly engage the community much earlier in the process, talking about priorities. In my experience, it is far easier and more meaningful from a department staff position to actually build a budget when we understand what your prior priorities are in advance. So if we can get that understanding from all of you, which does, and that usually is where I see public engagement, is where we have those discussions about what are the priorities coming forward. We have those discussions typically like May, June, July timeframe and then the budget gets billed that, that supports those priorities. Um, that is certainly the direction that I would like to go, and I'm going to have a lot more robust conversation with the mayor about some of those work sessions that, that you hear people talk about, executive retreats, um, and that would be happening much sooner in the process. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't have another question, but Councilmember Wilkerson, I just um, the public meeting portion of this committee doesn't start until uh, TV five has it going, and so I don't know if, and that's usually when you'll when you when you hear from me that that means we've got our technical thing set. So you might have done the minutes before it was actually a public meeting, even though you all could see it, but the public. So if you if you did that, I'd suggest that we. Revote on that just so that as part of the public, actual public meeting. Thanks. Thank you. We do that. I just want to say thank you, Tanya, for that. And we certainly engage the community is what we do because it is the community's money that we're spending for community services. That being said, can I have approval of the minutes from our last meeting, January 25th? So moved. I need a second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We move to second. Approved. The minutes are approved. Uh, this is my second meeting where we approve the minutes twice. 
I think I'm on a roll here. So <laughs> it may just become standard procedure. I'll do it at the beginning and at the end. If there's nothing more to come before this committee today, our next meeting will be Monday, March 15th at our usual time of 1.15. And so thank everyone. And we will see most of you back later today at 1.15 for our next meeting as this is a long day. Thank you, everyone. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, reach out to your council members or anyone on staff that can assist you. Have a good one.